all those people from the Montreal are with us here tonight. Um, I would like to say that this program has been initiated and coordinated by the program development develop of the Dean of Students Office. And myself and my colleague Irene Devine have been working on it for quite a long while. And both of us, and I'll speak for her right now, would like to thank all the participants who have helped make this three-day program a reality. The Loyola Students Association, the Campus Center, Loyola's Health Services, Loyola's Guidance Center, the Continuing Education Department, and the Loyola Visiting Lectures Committee. That kind of ends the list. Um, as well, I'd like to briefly mention uh, an outline of the program. For those of you who are of Concordia, you'll be familiar with the FYI, which is the university uh, internal publication, and there's a detailed outline of the three-day program in that paper. There are also some brochures here available which outline the program. Uh, briefly, um, we start tonight with Dr. Sellier. Tomorrow, um, Dr. Sume Grobe of the Guidance Center will be speaking in the two conference rooms to the side of this main hall, and she'll be teaching autogenic exercises for relaxation, and that's from 12 to 2. And from 2 to 5, Dr. Wade Gettner from the New York Hypnosis Center will be talking about hypnosis as um, relaxation therapy. So you're all welcome to attend that. On our third day, uh, starting with ten, uh, 10 o'clock in the morning, we've got the health services talking about alcohol and giving you information about alcohol and how it is used, uh, I suppose, in a stressful kind of way. Uh, they'll be taking blood pressure tests as well and showing the film, and Dr. McClure from the health services will be leading a discussion, uh, commenting on the film, which is a follow-up to Future Shock. As well, the biophysical education department will be on hand in the afternoon to talk about recreational activities, how to plan them for yourself, what kinds you should be doing and shouldn't be doing, etc. and there'll be discussion as well. And in the evening, uh, Gordon Inkley's um, who will be with us to teach us, to lecture, and to show us how to massage. So <laughs> it's a participatory kind of program. So do come along with a partner and join in. He'll be showing. <laughs> I, I wouldn't say this, but he'll be showing his film, The Art of Sensual Massage, which won an award. <laughs> so do come along. <laughs> For the Gordon Inkley's program, uh, there are free tickets available in the Dean of Students office. And for any of the other of the programs, you're just welcome to come. And everything will be happening in this area or in the two conference rooms. To launch our activities, we've got Dr. Sellier with us here tonight. That name, it seems to me, as I've been using it for the last two months, seems to be common vocabulary in most households. And as late as this afternoon, someone called me and said, I want two tickets to hear Dr. Selya, you know, the stress man. <laughs> so, I'd like to add a few more comments to um, that kind of little picture by telling you that Dr. Selye is internationally known for his scientific work as well as the books that he has written. He is um, a founder and a pioneer in a lot of the research that has been done on He is the president of the Université de Montréal's Institute on Experimental Medicine and Surgery, and as well, the director of the International Institute of Stress. He's the author of 33 books, I think that's what I, I read, 33 books, of which Stress Without Distress is being used as a textbook in many of our own schools here in Quebec and countless articles, I couldn't begin to tell you how many. He's just told me that he received his 22nd doctorate a few days ago. So that's 20. <laughs> He's got um, honorary citizenship in more countries than I can name, and is the recipient of numerous medals, Loyola Medal. So with that, I'm just gonna say, here's Dr. Selye. Hello. Madam Chairperson, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, it's indeed a pleasure to be here on the Loyola campus again 
I've lectured here several times. I have lectured here to an extraordinarily large audience of psychology, psychology students, I remember. And Loyola will always go down in my memories as the school where I once lectured to the smallest audience in all my life. I have lectured here on one occasion to five people. <laughs> one of them was myself. <laughs> the other one was my wife. The third one was a projectionist. The fourth one was the person who introduced me, and one came all on his own. <laughs> now, that's quite an experience, I must say, because I didn't know how to go about it. I usually lecture to fairly large audiences. I have lectured on a few days ago, as you know, in the Belfi Wilfred Pelche uh, Auditorium on Place des Arts for the 40th anniversary of the stress concept. And the hall was virtually full, and it's, I understand, for 3,500 people. So it was quite a different type of auditorium. But I have lectured to all kinds of people in all kinds of languages and all kinds of specialties. My greatest distress is the following, and I might as well start with that. I lectured so often that I always have the feeling that you've all heard it before. The trouble is, all my books have been read, and I'm always asked to speak exactly on the same subject. Occasionally, I'm allowed to speak on stress as applied to something in particular. That's already a great relief. <laughs> For example, stress in nurses, stress in air traffic control. I gave the Armstrong lecture on stress in space medicine. So it can be a little bit different, but mostly they want to have the whole story, all as the most important events, in an about a one hour lecture. And when you get down 40 years of research to the absolute essentials that can be presented in a one hour lecture, you have just so many things that absolutely have to be said that it gets to be a little bit monotonous. I have seen him coming up the stairs, several faces that I've heard, have noticed before at lectures. And I apologize if I repeat myself, but I think for the majority's sake, one has to give a unified picture. And I will try to give you a story of stress, as I found it most useful to teach, because somehow you manage to get the highlights into it without becoming too technical. And uh, instead of giving it in a textbook-like fashion, like you have to know this A and B and C and D, I like to tell the story of stress as it developed. So that it is really not so much a lecture as the history of the concept, but as you go through it, starting from when we didn't know anything about it ourselves, you just gradually learn it without effort. The only thing I have to warn you against is don't get fooled by the fact that some of my stories have a certain suspense element in it or are humorous, because I did not come here to amuse you. I came here to teach, not to entertain. But on the other hand, I didn't come here to bore you either, so I try, I'm trying to make it entertaining. But one has to think of the actual meaning of the thing and not so much of the story. I found that it is easier to remember things if one has something to connect it with in everyday life of what happened to me at that time or what difficulties I had. So I'm going to just sit down here and talk to you as I would talk to some friends in our own living room and tell you the story, as I remember it. It all started, as far as I know, and that, I think, is an extremely useful thing to, to remember because it helped me an awful lot. In my other interests, I have two interests. One is stress and the other one is creativity. Day before yesterday, when I lectured to the Pan American Medical Society, to my great relief, I was allowed not to speak about stress. I was allowed to speak about creativity. And I think that in this lecture, you will have to have some, you will get some byproducts, let us say, of thoughts on creativity as such, which are equally applicable to medical research or research in any field, or even, does this work? Um, or even to even to creativity in, in outside of science, in, in arts, in, in business, in industry, in any creative thinking. 
I think that it is very interesting that the greatest discoveries in medicine, and I'm using medicine here only because that's the field with which I'm most familiar, have never been planned. They were always accidents. It, uh, it, uh, <laughs> she threw me off <laughs> a little bit. I didn't know what was going to happen. <laughs> this is <a> great interest. <laughs> the, whole, the whole thing, as far as I can remember, happened as an accident. And I had, had the unusual privilege at the Université de Montréal of being allowed to create a new fellowship or lectureship, a visiting lectureship, the Claude Bernard visiting lectures, which brought to Montreal some of the mo century's most outstanding medical ma research men. And I had an occasion to talk to them in an informal manner about how they made their research. And I can tell you that not one of them made it irreverent as this may seem by the scientific method. Now, the scientific method of Sir Francis Bacon is still the method of science which is taught in our schools as the way to make a discovery. And let me tell you that it just ain't true. <laughs> it has never been used by any experienced scientist. The idea of arriving logically by syllogisms and by logical conclusion from one step to another to a discovery which you plan in advance is completely impossible. It is even theoretically impossible. Because, you see, if you know what you're going to discover, then it isn't a discovery. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Now, I have reached that age at which I have no longer to fear not either the Medical Research Council or the National Research Council or the National Institutes of Health who have subsidized me with hundreds of thousands of dollars during my career and who all asked me to tell them in an application of what I'm going to discover. Now, if I knew what I'm going to discover, it wasn't a discovery anymore. It was not less important, perhaps, but it could be, for example, a development. Once somebody else made a discovery, let us say somebody discovered like Sir, Fre Sir, Sir, Sir Alexander Fleming has discovered penicillin, you can, with the scientific method, step by step, apply known methods of synthetic chemistry and synthesize it and perhaps even synthesize better derivatives. But to thus discover penicillin that way is quite impossible. You have to have a flash an intuitive flash, which is more an artistic than a logical act, and you have to be able to profit by it. Claude Bernard, the father of the science, which I have taught for 31 years now at the University of Montreal of experimental medicine, has put it very nicely. All discoveries are made by chance. Mais la chance, ne sourit qu'à ceux qui savent apprécier ses charmes. Or if you want to put it a little less poetically, chance only the prepared mind. By chance you see an awful lot of things, but you don't know what to do with it. Now, I can prove to you, and this may be a very good introduction to my lecture, that I personally could never have discovered penicillin. I have positive proof thereof. Because, you see, if you have never had an occasion to see the phenomenon of microbes being killed by mold, then nobody can blame you for not being intelligent enough or creative enough for not having discovered it. One can't blame you for not having discovered a northern village somewhere in the north of Canada if you have never been in the north of Canada. But when I was doing my postgraduate studies at Hopkins, I used to have lunch at the cafeteria with a professor of chemistry, and one day, I'll never forget, he came down green from, from, from terror and said, Hans, you know what happened to me? Some kind of a mold has crept into all my colonies. 
and it kills all the bacteria. We can't make any cultures anymore. Well, I couldn't see anything in it either. I said, well, what are you going to do? That's a tragedy. If you can't make any bacterial cultures, you can't diagnose bacterial diseases, what will happen? He said, well, the only thing that can happen is that we'll have to close the lab and sterilize everything, get rid of that mold. Meanwhile, we are sending our samples to other hospitals where they didn't have this scourge. Now, some 20 years later, Sir Alexander Fleming has made the same observation, saw the same thing. A mold, as you probably know, because by now they teach it on secondary school levels, crept into one of his cultures in, in a petri dish, which was badly closed and not hermetic, and uh, killed the bacteria around it, which you could see because there were no, no whitish bacterial growth visible. But he had something that we didn't have. He made the same observation, but he also had the genius to see that there is a great future to that. And it's worthwhile following that up. So he took some of that mold and identified it as penicillin, and later on that led to the discovery of penicillin. Well, Actually, penicillin has been described, not only seen like this, but actually described in scientific papers 16 times to the best of my knowledge before Fleming. And 16 people have shown, as I have shown, that we couldn't have discovered it if, even if it was dished out before us. And in each paper, the authors regretfully, so to speak, in small print, sometimes in a footnote, added to the paper that, you know, this is a beautiful culture medium for this or that bacterium, but I must admit that in two cases it didn't work because our cultures got contaminated with penicillium. Now, they all saw the same thing. It's only that somebody saw something in it. And that's the difference between seeing and discovering. We all saw, and people ever since the beginning of history saw the sun rise and set, rise in the east, set in the west, and still the sun does not rise. It does not set. And it took a Galileo and a Kepler's in intuitive greatness to see that it's the earth that turns away. I have great admiration for that kind of intelligence. And that is not pure intelligence. That is something that is between intelligence and art. It's something like intuition, and in my first book on stress, the stress of life, I made this statement which I thought would shock everybody, but apparently many people felt it but just didn't have the courage to say so. Pure intelligence, ladies and gentlemen, is not the highest quality of the human life, of the human mind. You have to have more than that. And that more than that is subconscious or is at least inexplicable with modern scientific methods. Now, to get to the stress story with this background, as far as I can remember, the first time I thought of stress was when I was a second year medical student. And uh, the professor of medicine showed us some patients whom he specifically selected from different wards, from pediatrics, from surgery, from infectious diseases, from internal medicine, and so on, specially selected to be very so as to show us how to ask intelligent questions and look for signs that are very characteristic and typical of disease. It was accepted as the very basis of medicine, and you have to follow that. Put yourself with me in the... which I must have been at the time. Not only that way will you profit by this. What could you do about it? Ever since the ba bacteriologist Pasteur, Koch, have shown that each specific disease, tuberculosis, leprosy, that is to say by specific disease, I mean a disease that can be identified as something particular, not just air fever, but tuberculosis, typhoid, had a specific cause. And it seemed perfectly obvious that uh, the only way to practice intelligent medicine is to first find out what's wrong with a patient and then try to find something that will help to get 
thing that causes him to be ill. It is so obvious that it is hardly necessary to talk about it. The only trouble with it is it isn't true. In that first lecture, I was highly emotional. And that, I think, is very important because that belongs to the more artistic or subconscious element of discovery, that if you are perfectly restful in thinking on purpose, not relaxing, as some of the other lecturers will show you how to relax and get the subconscious forward, you cannot have very intuitive thoughts because your intelligence interferes with prejudices of what you learned. You don't have free thinking. Some of the most interesting ideas came to people while they were half asleep. I know that some of the best ideas among the few I had were when I either fell asleep or was just about to wake up. So awake enough to catch the thought, but asleep enough not to inhibit it. Well, with this background did I go into medicine. That you must, first of all, to do, be a physician, know how to find out what the disease is. And I was very much impressed by Professor von Jaksch, who was one of the most famous uh, uh, hematologists of the time, giving his introductory lecture on, on diagnosis. How do you diagnose a disease? <clears throat> and I will never forget, for example, how he looked for reflexes of the pupil to light, for certain skin rashes and so on. And from that, he could diagnose what's wrong with the patient. A particularly great impression was made of a child who came from pediatrics. And he told him to open his mouth and say, ah, as one says to children in pediatrics. And he looked at the internal surface of the jaws on the, on the mucous membrane there. He saw little white spots. Those are called coplics spots because Professor Koplik first described them and as soon as he saw those spots he said, ah, that's measles. And to the spirit of a young, very enthusiastic scient uh, medical student, realizing that medicine has forgotten so far that just by looking at little spots in the mouth you can discover a viral disease due to an agent so small that even the best microscopes, except for electron microscopes, couldn't see it. I was awestruck. That's the only expression for it. But then I thought. I wondered why it is that this great diagnostic thought of every conceivable symptom and sign that I would never have thought of in my ignorance, but he never mentioned the one thing that was obvious even to me without knowing any medicine. All these people, whatever their disease, looked sick. <laughs> now that's a little joke I'm playing on you. Because I give that same lecture because wherever I go is what made you think of stress. And I lectured in Tokyo, I lectured in Moscow, I lectured in, in Leningrad and in, in, in Berlin and in Paris. And whenever I tell this story, everybody laughs. And let me tell you that that is the secret of the whole story. Don't forget that you laughed. That is the obvious. If somebody is sick, he looks sick. So what? And as a matter of fact, I went to all my professors and I said, why didn't anybody study this common syndrome that is not specific? If you get up in the morning, you know very well that you are sick. That's why you go to the physician. But you know, don't know what's wrong with you. You just don't feel good, you don't want to work, you'd rather lie down, you lose your appetite, you lose, lose your energy. There are many other signs, for example, usually after a while you lose your appetite. You seem to walk very carefully so that it's only the most can, can enter. But <laughs> each time I lose my audience, so could you make it a little bit less forceful? <laughs> I... <laughs> I wondered why, why didn't anybody study that? Well, the professor told me, well, this is perfectly stupid because if somebody is fat, well, naturally he looks fat. There's nothing to it. 
That isn't true. Because you will immediately know that that's not the same thing. If somebody looks fat, and you say this man is fat, you just said what you saw. If I see this glass here, and I say the glass is here, that's not a discovery. But if you say that no matter what disease you have, be it typhoid or, or, or cancer or tuberculosis, that all these very different diseases have some common factor, have a common face. That's an abstraction. Because you abstracted from the specific effects of typhoid, of cancer, and have discovered that there is something common to them all. This is the secret of most great discoveries. You have to be able to abstract. For example, let me give you an element example which will get you closer to the stress concept in a minute. But we already have established the syndrome of just being sick. That's how I thought of it at that time. We didn't have any other name for it. And people just said that, that that's nothing to discover. There is not, no future to it. They didn't see the charms of nature, that there is something there. In this room, I'm using this here because my voice wouldn't carry far enough, so it makes noise. That lamp here gives me light. The air conditioner in addition to making this disagreeable noise, also is supposed to make either heat or cold. The conditioner can make either heat or cold. Now what could be more different than heat, cold, light, and sun? Yet there is a common element to them. Electricity. Stop the electricity in this room and none of them will work. But it would be very difficult for somebody who never heard of electricity to think that there is anything common between that lamp and this loudspeaker. And it is extremely difficult for a scientist, even today, when he actually faces a case of typhoid and a case of cancer, to see the common element. When I explain it to individual people or even groups, they understand it right away. But the next time he's actually faced with the situation in life, in medicine or in the non-specific is like a red herring. It covers the specific and vice versa, and he isn't able to see it anymore. It disappears. You know, it's like those pictures they make for children, that if you look at it from a certain point of view, it looks like a tree, but you have to look at it from, from a very special point of view because the other lines cover the pattern too much. Well, anyhow, I didn't get with this very far because nobody wanted to even listen to me. And uh, it wasn't until 10 years later, here in Montreal at McGill University, where I started my academic career, that the same syndrome presented itself by sheer accident again. In other words, I missed it the first time. I didn't miss it quite because I saw, I was convinced there is something in it, but I missed it to the point where I didn't push it any further. I had to pass exams, and that was more important to me. So, 10 years later, and this is the gospel truth, ladies and gentlemen, at least I can say about stress that I have seen it grow from the embryo to the present stage. My first assignment in Canada, when I came from Johns Hopkins, from Europe where, where I was born, I went first for my postgraduate studies to the and uh, then I came up to Canada here. And uh, my first academic assignment of biochemistry, then under the direction of Professor Collip, the discoverer of parathyroid hormone, and one of the first co-workers of Sir Frederick Banting on the isolation of insulin. I had an immense respect for him and blindly obeyed all his orders and believed all he said to me. And he said, he said to me, that I'm sure the ovary, the female sex gland, must make a hormone other than the two we knew of, progesterone and the so-called estrogens. Now the theory behind that I won't tell you. It was a typical Baconian theory. It was logically derived according to the laws of Sir, uh, Sir uh, Francis Bacon. 
And uh, it seemed perfectly acceptable to me. But I didn't even question it because I knew he was very good. And I just wanted some work to do. So my first academic assignment was to go out to the slaughterhouse here and collect some cattle over it. Collecting the cattle ovaries was that I had to have ovaries in order to extract the cattle ovarian extract. I approached this with a certain prejudice because I was sure that since it was ovaries, it must be an ovarian principle, and it had to be if you injected it into the animal that no known ovarian hormone would do. So he made the extracts, and the boring task was to try these extracts without even knowing how they were made and injecting them into animals and seeing whether you could find to make any change that the non-ovarian hormone would not produce. So I went out to the slaughterhouse and fulfilled my first academic assignment with singular distinction. <laughs> the bucket was full and the ovaries were still hot because they had to be fresh and he went to work and extracted them and then he told them, now you test them out and inject them into animals and see whether they will produce anything that uh, the hormone will not produce. Well, they did. They produced what we call in medicine a triad. That is to say, a syndrome, a set of manifestations consisting of three parts. Atrophy, that is to say shrinkage of the lymphatic organs, which includes the thymus, which is a large lymph node here, which we now know is connected with immune reactions, defense reactions against foreign objects like a bacteria, for example, or against grafts, which rejects a graft. The li lymph nodes, which you can feel in little nodes like this, which are the thymico-lymphatic system. The second manifestation was gastric, and duodenal ulcers, peptic ulcers. They all had hyperactive adrenal glands. Those are two little glands above the which normally are white because they, are, they contain fat, which contain the hormones of the adrenal glands, cortical 